and welcome to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Avenue. I'm Jenna Harner, joined by, of course, Taylor Haas Jordan. Is not with us today, although she's always, you know, we always carry her spirit with us too. So when we're trash talking, I don't know how to say trash talking, but when we're talking about the flyers in a couple segments to come, know that she is here in spirit and she fully co-signs everything that we say uh, in terms of that aspect. Uh, but Taylor, let's kind of dive into things because uh, right before we started uh, recording here, the Penguins uh, broke a little bit of interesting news. I know a lot of people are excited about this one, but uh, big Jeff Carter uh, is staying in Pittsburgh a little bit longer than I think some people anticipated. He uh, signed a contract extension here. Yeah, two years. A, a bit of a su- surprise for Carter just because I feel like we didn't even know if he was going to keep playing beyond this year. I mean, even when he got traded to Pittsburgh, you know, he had last year and then this year. And I remember his first uh, introductory press conference, he was asked, like, are you even going to play next year? And he, he laughed and he's like, yeah, I'm going to play. But beyond that, you don't know. Is he going to want to go back out, you know, west, be closer to his family because they're still in L.A.? Um, Does he maybe want to go to a team that maybe is more of a shore contender, I guess you could say, Uh, because, you know, the core is getting older. He's also pretty old, too. But, um, yeah, again, a great fit here for the Penguins. I think third line center, he's the perfect guy for that. You think of just, like, how many – players they've gone through looking for like a real third line center in recent years and how costly that experiment has been you think like even even like Derek Broussard alone like how many like prospects picks did they lose making that move and then undoing it and then now that they have a guy that actually fits in that role and can move up top six in the in the wing if if that's needed um it's just a no-brainer for me yeah, and it was so funny. I mean, you mentioned that we didn't know if he was going to play. Like, I remember everybody talking when they protected him in the expansion draft, and everyone's like, why would you protect him? Like, he might not even play next year. And yeah. now I just kind of, like, we look back and we we chuckle a little bit. But, I mean, I think also you have to look at, to just – the intangibles we always hear Mike Sullivan talk about that we always hear you know a lot of the players talk about it too but the veteran leadership what he brings to this group like they really love that especially with you know I mean obviously you have the core but I think he's kind of also fitting in to that core in a veteran way really well yeah and the the term um I mean the salary great too um you know the Penguins are in a in a camp crunch and to get someone like him because we don't know what's going to happen you know Malkin's going to resign Latang's going to resign we have no idea what the salary cap is going to look like next season he resigned um it's just over three million that's a slight raise from what they're paying this year it's only a 500,000 raise but just seeing what he's like you said he always fit into the court and then just the way he's been able to produce and you know to move up into the top six if he's needed I just think all the intangibles everything together uh you know about Third million cap hit. That's really not that bad for for a third a real third line center, and it's so he's it's a two year deal. Normally, if if a player retires in the middle of a contract, it just goes away. But the the kind of contract Jeff Carter signed, uh, so it's like a thirty five plus contract is what it's called. It's when a player is thirty. They sign it when they're thirty five years or older. It's multi year and it's front loaded, meaning the salary is higher in the beginning and then it you know drops and that's how his is structured so when it's yeah. a contract like that um if they retire in the middle there is a uh, a penalty so it doesn't just go away so for for him to sign this kind of contract and the penguins to you know give him that kind of contract there has to be a high level of confidence that he is going to play for those two years and he's not going to retire uh in the middle so um yeah just just great move overall yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot of Penguins fans very excited and wondering if there's uh, any but light platinum ties in here. Uh, Tuca got the little. Yeah, Tuca, he signed in Boston and they shipped him like a bunch of cases of Bud Light and they signed and like uh, they they actually sent him a contract on Twitter. There's like, you know, if you win the cup, then you get this many. Like, how does Jeff Carter not get the Bud Light Platinums? He's gotten his fruit snacks. <laughs> like, I was going to say, gets- Welch's, come on. Also, yeah. Welch's and Bud Light Platinum, we need it. It might be in the, the fine print, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's incredible. That Oh, you just, you just have to laugh. But honestly, I mean, it's definitely... A very good move um, for the team uh, moving forward, too, with how they've been playing. And that kind of leads right into uh, the next thing we're going to talk about. I mean, 
Yes, it's the Arizona Coyotes, but the way in which they beat the Coyotes, I think was really, for me, kind of an indication of where this team is right now because the way that they've kind of gone through this stretch, they've won 17 of their last 19. They're whatever the Coyotes was their sixth straight win. You're playing a lot of Western Conference teams, but we saw kind of, you know, uh, the the Winnipeg game, the couple games prior, I think from like the Vegas game, maybe even the Anaheim game to leading up to the Coyotes game, you haven't seen the best hockey from this team. And that's something we talked about a little bit last week, but this was kind of, uh, hey, this is kind of the identity of this team. They were able to kind of bounce back and then they just got the th- the ball rolling. I mean, there's so much we can talk about from this game too. It was unreal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the the first period was just, honestly, might have been the most boring period we've seen them play at all. I mean, there's not a whole lot happening, not a whole lot of chances. And given that it was against the Coyotes, who are, you know, in the Shane Wright sweepstakes, that was kind of concerning um, because they should not be having a period like that against the Coyotes. And then the way they did come back, 6-3, to three, uh, Sullivan, he brought out the word stick to uh, I think that was a good example of that. But, uh, I mean, a lot to like in that game. Two crazy plays. I mean, the Crosby assist on Brian Russ. We have to talk about that first. That was, that was crazy. It was on the power play. Russ was at the left circle. You watch the clip. Crosby didn't look at him for like a, a while when he was getting, you know, to the, the net front. But I mean, he knows where Russ is on the, on that, on that power play. Doesn't look, puts it between not only his own legs, but Anton Strawman's legs, just back to Russ and Russ, Russ scores. And I mean, I asked, I asked Latang about it after the game, like, what's going through your mind when you see him, you know, just do something like that? And he's like, I mean, are you guys surprised? <laughs> he's right, because Crosby manages to do these things that are like so unbelievable, but also like to be expected. And yeah. he's the only guy who can do that. It, it's just process. fascinating. What was his goal the other day too, where it was one of those, like you just, it was like such, it was the tip in or it was like a bank or something. It was. He's, yeah. He's had like reader, a couple like redirects like recently. And then also like the, like drop to like the one knee, like from like a tough angle. It's just like a lot of like peak Sidney Crosby goals we've been seeing as yes. of late. Um, and I mean, I feel like good time to mention now he is on milestone watch. That was the 497 he's nearing 500 just uh crazy uh record to see from him uh, approaching but uh that's kind of the thing you expect to see from Crosby not really what you expect to see from Brian Boyle but no like, no that's, that's like, what he did oh my <laughs> when God. he did that I just like I I no words I didn't know what like I'm like I, I was like did that just happen like I had to wait for the replay before because it was like Brian Boyle did just put it between his own legs and like lift the top shelf that didn't just happen right that's that's Brian Boyle um that's exactly what happened yep yep nope that was that was like the, I feel like I'm just saying oh, like oh peak like chell like NHL like peak chell goal but that was what it was it was just and I, I will admit I was not uh, paying attention to the third period of that game. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if you saw on Twitter. I was full cookie baking mode. It was some birthdays at work. I'm just like, you know what? Eh. So I, I, you know, had it on. I'm listening and stuff, but I'm, my attention was not there. You better believe I turned to the TV and just I literally was like, what? What just <laughs> happened? What on earth happened right there? It was one of those things. I mean. Oh, I think I saw a tweet that was like, if you're the Arizona Coyotes and Brian Boyle scores that type of goal on you, like you just got to have it up in the home, like it's time. Yeah, not exactly your typical fourth line grinder type goal, but we have seen, you know, I think more, at least more offense than we've seen from Brian Boyle than I think we expected, just given his age, he didn't even play professional hockey last season at all. Um, He's never been, you know, he's always kind of had this kind of role when he's been in the, but yeah, he's five goals. So he's on pace for 10. Um, He Sullivan said, you know, they kind of, they, they hoped they would see this from him. Sullivan said, you know, he has good hands. Um, You know, going back to the time in New York, because Sullivan was an assistant coach for Boyle in New York. um, Mm -hmm. They said they kind of hoped to see this from him. um, And, yeah, he said, you know, he's he's pleased with what we've seen from Boyle, and that's what they need. We've talked about depth, how often, and contributions throughout the lineup. I don't think they're always going to look like that, Brian Boyle going between the legs, Tom Shelf, but, um, yeah, it's just a great thing to see from this team. 
Yeah, and we'll touch on this a little bit more. We do a little bit of an injury update next segment. But obviously, with the role that Boyle is stepping into right now, I mean, leading into that game, I think in the morning skate, he said something to the extent of, you know, we just have to stick to it. We really have to kind of, you know, play our game. We know what we're capable of, which you hear all the time, of course. But, you know, we have to keep doing what we're doing and we'll continue to generate those chances. And then, you know, he says that and goes out there and scores a goal like that last night or on Tuesday night. I don't know if that's a precursor or anything along those lines, but uh, yeah, looking uh, looking pretty good from him. Yeah, I'd love to know. So he told us like a while ago that, you know, after all of his games, you know, he he talks with his, his uh, oldest son, like on the phone, because, you know, they're in Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, he said we, we talked him one time after a goal before and, you know, Brian's like hyped about this goal. And his son was like, well, I scored like, you know, three today in my game, <laughs> like just clowning him. So like, I'd love to know what his son told him after that game, because, I mean, crazy stuff to see from Brian Boyle, but I don't know if his son had a couple more uh, goals in his game that maybe wouldn't be too impressed. I think we would need to ask his son uh, which between the legs was better, Sid's <laughs> or uh, Dad's, because... His his son is a Crosby fan. Boyle did tell us, like, what early on that he he got his son a Penguins jersey and it says Boyle, it, Boyle 11 on the back, and when his son turned it around, he was disappointed that it wasn't Sid. So, I don't know, I feel like he'd still like Sid's move better than his dad's. Oh my god! I remember seeing that clip, and you could just see like the little bit of defeat in his face. <laughs> like, I mean, I get it, Sidney Crosby, but like, not even like this kid. It's like I'm your dad. Hello. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, too too funny. Well, why don't we take a quick break? Uh, we mentioned injury updates. We will come back, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, look at some of the uh, backup goalie situation and uh, some fun Twitter stuff. So stick with us on podcast on Fifth Avenue. We'll be right back. All right, and welcome back uh, to podcast on Fifth Avenue. So it's funny, I, I typically name our episodes when, when these go up on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to it. And the one last week, I named it The Penguins Are Finally Healthy, because they were. Drew O'Connor was the only injury at the time, and he, even with the depth they had, you know, he wouldn't be in the roster anyway. We're like, this is crazy. We're going to get to see what a fully healthy Penguins lineup looks like. Literally, it was the next morning that they had a guy go down. It was Louis Domingue in the morning skate. Brian Boyle bring a shot off of his foot. D- Domingue didn't see it uh, coming. He's out week to week. Uh, right foot, we don't know what exactly. Uh, Zucker had core muscle surgery. Teddy Bluger, he got that hit from Brennan Dillon uh, in the corner against the Jets. He had surgery to repair a fractured jaw. Uh, Aston Reese even missed a game you know, in the last week. So all that hope about how we're going to see a fully healthy Penguins lineup. Domingue's going to compete for the backup job. Uh, it didn't happen. But it was first, yeah, I think we should touch on the, the hit on Teddy Bluger. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you saw that. Just what, what did you think about the hit? I, I thought it was a headshot. I was expecting discipline to come, and I was a little bit surprised when we didn't see it. Yeah, it's one of those ones you almost anticipated, like, okay, if it wasn't going to be called in the moment, there was going to be some sort of, like, supplementary discipline yeah. from the league themselves. That didn't happen. And uh, head coach Mike Sullivan, not too happy about that. He was full-on quoting the rule book, um, just, you know, was saying it was the letter of the law. I mean, when you watch the hit, and especially in slow motion, which I know everybody kind of has their own things of, like, when you slow-mo things down, you see everything. People aren't huge fans of replay. But this was one of the ones it's like, the shoulder into the head, into the boards. Like it, it was, and watching Bluger, I mean, oh man, like that was scary. There was a lot of blood. And I know this is classic, like, oh, you know, being afraid of blood. But it, that was, that was a, a very, very, very aggressive hit. Intent, whatever behind it, sure, whatever your thoughts are there. But I don't know. I feel like that one should have come. I mean, that, that it seems like, I mean, Mike Sullivan quoted the rule book, but it is like almost to a T what the rule is. And if you're not going to have, you're going to have rules in place, but you're not going to, you know, I mean, we know what the NHL does from time to time, but like that feels like what clearer picture can you get? Yeah. I I know I tweet about, I had a lot of like angry Jets fans when I mentioned like he didn't leave his feet and it's like, yeah, but he's still like, that's, you still can't hit the head. No. And 
he he kept like one of his feet on the ground, but he still did kind of launch himself upwards into Bluger. Brendan Dillon's a big guy; he doesn't need to be doing that to make the hit. I just um, surprised, but also not surprised that we didn't see discipline and the explanation. Because we after that game, Sullivan said, you know, he thought it was a headshot, and he was asked, you know, what explanation did you get from the officials about you know why it wasn't called, and he said. Uh, they they said they didn't see it and so something like that is not allowed to be a lot of people were like why didn't they look at it on video that something like that they can't review it in the moment but i i think that's a discussion of maybe that's something we can you know they change the rules every summer it seems like and reviewing penalties was never really a thing at all recently they did add you know if a major is called on the ice you can re review it on video maybe rescind it or reduce it so yeah. They're not, a, you know, it's not like they, they won't add video review or they're afraid of adding video review. So I think maybe I, you, this isn't something you can add for every single uh, penalty, but maybe, you know, for potential head contact, if you want to look at it, I think that would go a long way for reducing it in, in the game if players know that, you know, with that gray area, they're not going to get away with it as easily in the moment. So I don't know. But, uh, yeah, a tough loss in, in Louis Deming too. Uh, it's such like a I you gotta feel really bad for him because he's had this is now his third kind of major injury this season all of them happened in practices the first one he he missed the first three and a half weeks or so at a training camp with an injury from camp uh he played for about a month in Wilkesbury was outstanding uh got hurt in practice in Wilkesbury missed a month played one game in Wilkesbury and then got the call up uh, and I mean, we've been talking the last, you know, two weeks about how we think he can, you know, compete for the job for the Smith and that, that game in San Jose, uh, it, it looked like, you know, he really could make a run for the backup job, but yeah, it's tough. I, I did see him the day later that day and he was on crutches. It looked like he was struggling on the crutches. And I was like, ah, oh, like, <laughs> like, that's not good. And then, uh, since then, uh, he now has a boot on his right foot and he's on a scooter. Um, the kind of scooter where like you put your knee on the scooter and like so you're not putting any weight on your foot it was it was kind of funny i mean we're sitting in, like the media room waiting for like uh the meet the availability like the following game and he just goes scooting by and, like, <laughs> <laughs> Bing. It's like and then, yeah it, i mean because he, he was getting some speed on that thing and i was like was that him um but <laughs> how fast do we think it can go I don't know. Like, you take anything that off any sweet jumps yet? Like, but, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna ask. is he like but, scooting down the hill of the arena there? Like, I, I mean, know. Is he up to like, I, you might be able to like, hit like 15, 20 miles an hour on that thing. Donuts in the parking lot. But yeah, it's just <laughs> tough to see from him. You could see it in the video of, was it Jari giving the helmet to Latang after the Coyotes win? Um, yep. He's in the back on his little scooter. He's got a basket in front to hold his water bottle, other stuff. So the hits just keep coming. Another injury we got to mention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I tweeted oh, it. Oh, no. That's Poor magical. Louis. Magical. Yeah. You got to feel awful for him. I, I, I believe, like, Nick, but that was Nick Benino's scooter, like, or the same scooter when he was here. He was on it for a while when he had an injury. So um, I don't know. I haven't seen it since then. So. Good to see them break out Nick Benito's scooter. But before we talk about the backup goalie situ situation, another uh, injury we got to mention, Bo Bennett. Um, I don't know if we have like newer like listeners, viewers who weren't really around when he was here, but it was a running thing. The Bo was always hurt. And it, the worst luck, it, the one injury, he tore both labrums in his shoulder. That's one that stands out from – celebrating a goal like he he celebrated he put his arms up skated into the glass tore both labrums in his shoulder and that just sums up Bo Bennett's time in Pittsburgh I think he was always hurt um he tweeted a picture of him in a hospital bed on, on Tuesday night um and he said home is where you make it just got diagnosed with being a severe case of being a huge beauty worst case they've ever seen they said hashtag something's ever changed and I I quote tweeted it and I was like, so day to day? And he said, no, LTIR. And someone asked him like, no, what, what are you actually in the hospital for? So uh, he said it's an appendix. So uh, Bo Bennett, the hits just keep coming, Bo's hurt again. Uh, but yeah, I mean, back to the, the backup goalie thing. We haven't seen, well, so we saw the Smith in Columbus, he got pulled after 20 minutes. Uh, 
part of that, so that shouldn't have been his game anyway. Coming off of COVID, no. he'd only had one practice. That would have been Deming's game. Deming was going to back up. You know, it's not a back-to-back. So, yeah, he, he went out. Jari came in. Jari was perfect in relief. So now that DeSmith has had a couple practices, I mean, we haven't seen him since. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I'm, we're probably going to see him here soon because they do have a back-to-back Seattle and Detroit. But, I mean, if he has, you know, another game where he doesn't look his best and it's a real problem, I don't know what the answer is because, again, Louis week-to-week doesn't seem like he's going to be back anytime soon. Anytime DeSmith has a bad game, I, if I get fans tweet at me, at me like, call up Philip Lindbergh. Philip Lindbergh has been hurt since November, and he was day to day for a little bit, and now he's currently longer term. So mm-hmm. that's not going to be an option. Um, Alex Dorio has been incredible in Wilkesbury as of late, but again, he's 22, hasn't played in the NHL yet. He's not going to be a long term backup option. Maybe he comes up as a third goalie at some point, gets in a game here. They just yeah. started him four day, four games and five days on there. Crazy stuff, and he handled it well. Well, um, so he's some of that maybe like down the line we see at some point, but again, he's not the backup option right now. It seems like the options are either Smith gets his stuff together. Um, he did get new pads. Maybe that was the problem. I don't know. Now they're white with gold on the side. So mm-hmm. look good, feel good, play good, or they go out via trade, try to find someone, but I don't know. What do you think we see here? I'll be really intrigued to kind of see, I mean, with the trade deadline nearing as close as it is, because how it's what, am I, is it two? It's one month, two months? I don't March, know. March, I think it's first week of March, I think. Yeah, I so yeah. almost a month away. That's okay. Yeah. That, I was like, I feel like that's the right timeline. I, my brain is still football mode. I'm like <laughs> getting back to hockey. I'm like, oh, I need all these dates, all this calendar stuff. <laughs> um, It'll be really interesting to see, I mean, if he can turn things around here. Because if, you know, what we've seen from DeSmith and like we talked about, you know, last season DeSmith was playing phenomenal hockey. So it's kind of that mindset of like, okay, what changed here? What's going on? Also, we heard Mike Sullivan on Wednesday kind of take a little bit of ownership and say, you know, it was kind of my fault that I put Casey out there too soon. Like we shouldn't have done that. And he was, you know, saying the goaltending position is arguably like one of the hardest to come back from when we're talking about putting guys back in the lineup from COVID, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, just the repetition. And he was talking about, you know, the goaltender position is that spot where, you know, you need practice reps versus throwing Sid out there and saying, hey, you're okay, go get back on the ice type thing. It's a whole different world. Um, and he talked about how he's been working with goaltenders coach Andy Kyoto a lot and just kind of what that dynamic is like. I mean, we saw, again, you saw kind of the transformation uh, with Jari. So you feel like you want to see it's possible for DeSmith. And I think it is too. I think also, you know, a lot of it's mental. A lot of it is a really, really big part of that. We know that that's a huge part of the game. Um, but for him, it's going to be, you know, can he get out of his head a little bit? And like you said, with the pads, look good, play good. Maybe this is what it takes for him to be like, all right, you know, we're good. Everything's fine. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I I would have been intriguing again, if Domingue didn't get hurt to kind of see that backup battle. Um, I'm going to be intrigued to see if they go out and get somebody because all of a sudden, and not that this team wasn't, but everybody kind of, you know, at the start of the season looked at this team like, Ooh, are they even going to make the playoffs? Is this the year the playoff streak's going to end? And now it's like, oh, wait, this team's a legitimate cup contender. Yeah, and I mean, so when when Deming went down and the talk of, like, do they go out and get, you know, a backup really, you know, amped up, it's tough because, like, they really, you know, when they're getting healthy, there's really – no cap space at all so fans flurry is the name that people keep bringing up even so the max the team can retain in a sal in a trade uh salary wise is half he makes seven million which means that you know if they trade for him his cap hit would be 3.5 if chicago retains the max they they can't take that on and some of you know the other options out there, you know, like Halak was the name that was thrown out there Pro- earlier on when the Canucks were bad, but now the Canucks are like pushing for a playoff spot. And, you know, probably earlier in the season, maybe you could have gotten Halak for like you know prospect or draft pick because the Canucks are a young rebuilding team. And then Bruce Boudreau comes in, turns the team around. They're not that far out of a playoff spot, and at the pace they're going, like they can get in. So 
I mean, maybe that means they don't want to move Halak, or now if they do want to move Halak, maybe they want a player back who can help them now, which means now the Penguins would maybe have to sacrifice, you know, an asset part of that depth. So no real answers. I think something maybe interesting to consider. So Zucker, we don't know when he's going to be back. When he had his surgery, um, they said no timetable yet. He's going to keep being evaluated right now week to week. So the way long-term injured reserve works is, you know, you that only benefits the team while the guy is on there. So once, you know, he's back, there's no way any of that cap relief helps you later on. It's only temporary. But if he's not going to play again this season, if, if for whatever reason, like, this is going to take him a while to come back from, they could Nikita Kucherov it, you know, like, long-term IR him. And then, you know, that's a lot of space to work with. And then maybe, you know... Flurry's cap hit isn't that bad uh, mm-hmm. because when they can afford it. Again, uh, who, for all nobody knows, Zucker is just going to be like a month or two when he comes back. But, I mean, something interesting to consider that, you know, if, if this turns into a Kucherov situation, that definitely could help them go out and get a backup goalie. The other name uh, people throwing out there, Brayden Holtby, yep. that would be uh, pretty crazy, especially because apparently the Caps – Looking into Flurry, if if Flurry ends up on the Caps and Braden Holtby ends up on the Penguins, like crazy stuff. <laughs> you know like what? There's some like time switch continuum, some like you know time space continuum, whatever that is. Some something that happens if that happens. Like maybe that's what takes us to go back to normal in, ty- in like entirety. Maybe that's like the nine poor crux or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's. It's funny, sitting up, like, in the press box, you know, I do, like, look around, like, at the jerseys always, like, in the crowd in front of me. And it's, like, if I were playing, like, bingo or whatever, like, on my board, you know, there'd be, like, a Brandon Tan of Kraken jersey. Um, yep. All three of Fleury's teams, I mean, Penguins, you know, Golden Knights in Chicago, you always see them. And then a lot of Kessel Coyotes, like, Kachina jerseys. So, Penguins fans have a problem moving on. <laughs> Fleury, been around for a while. Kessel, the two cups, you know, there's good reason for the players that they latch on to, but, you know, if if Fleury is a cap, or are we going to see caps jerseys? I, I think that would be the deal breaker. That's the one uh, step too far. That's that's yeah. the line. And then thank you, Cross. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good, uh, good time to wrap up this segment. We're going to take a break, be right back, talk about uh, a historic day for the Flyers uh, and other, other fun things. All right, and we are back. And like I said, uh, a historic day for the Flyers in more way than one. On Tuesday, the first one we got to touch on, um, they set a franchise record losing streak, 13 games. Uh, they've lost 13 straight. That's the most in Flyers franchise history. Um, you know, something, when I saw that, so the Penguins hold the record for longest losing streak at 18 games, the 3 4 X generation Penguins did it. The Sabres actually tied it in 2021. So uh, 18 games is the record. Two teams have it. Flyers are at 13. We're kind of in that territory of like, are they gonna are they gonna get there? When I looked at you know who they play their their next five games and their next four, they play LA, Winnipeg, and then Detroit. Uh, I think it's a home and home twice. And then game 18 is in Pittsburgh on February 15th. So. The Penguins could potentially deal the Flyers a historic L, uh, at least have them tie the record if, if this holds up. And, you know, uh, the game after that is against the Capitals. So if it's it's not an easy schedule, you know, moving forward. Uh, Detroit, the worst, you know, that group, but still Detroit has been playing better than the Flyers. So uh, this is just something to, to watch for. Uh, look look forward to February 15th if that happens. And then uh, Keith Handel, that same game, a uh, historic night for a good reason. He set the Ironman streak, 965 games. That's the new NHL record most consecutive games. And you just look back when he was in Florida. Didn't uh, Quenville want to healthy scratch him? Yes. That- and then – didn't he like break his jaw once you were like some like fractured something and was like, nope, I'm coming back out. Like, I mean, that's just yes. a 
phenomenal feat when you think about it. It's so many years of games and it's just like generations. You're like, um... It's impressive. That's really, they, they call it the Iron Man award, or yeah. no, award. they call it the Iron Man yeah. for a reason. Phil Kessel's pretty close. I think he's at like 940. Like he's, he ranks third all, all time now. So he, he's, um, you know, could potentially pass him if Yandel misses the game. I don't think that's going to happen though with everything Yandel's been through. I, uh, the Flyers, uh, <laughs> everyone likes ripping on the Flyers. They actually have some fun people on the team. Um, Kevin Hayes, he's a fun guy. Keith Yandel is another really fun, just personality. Um, anytime you see like these locker room videos, but my favorite thing that he he's kind of like known for on the ice, he calls it a song. Um, and it's when he goes behind, you know, his own net, he has the puck and he's waiting to, you know, start a breakout or whatever. And there's an opponent kind of waiting for him to make a move and he'll fake him out. And, if the guy bites, you know, and, and sees the fake, he'll sonk at him. And he does it loud enough that, like, you hear it on the TV broadcast. And he does it several times a year. It's not just, like, in a, you know, a couple-time thing. He did it uh, when Florida was in uh, Pittsburgh. It was Thomas DePauli had just come out from Wilkes-Barre. It was only his second-ever game. The Penguins were losing, and it was, you know, Yandel's behind the knee, and Yandel sunked him, and it's like, you can't do that to the rookie, because he got him. <laughs> and uh, Thomas DePauli never played an NHL game after that, so. Um, uh, it was funny. We were in uh, Philly, and Mike Matheson was behind, you know, his net kind of in the same position, and there's a flyer, and, and he tried to do – and. <laughs> No one even like came close to believing him. Uh, no. I I don't know because Matheson what would he he would have, would have played with the Andal in, in Florida. So I when I saw that I was like, is he trying to impress his former teammate? Like it was inspired. But like, I can do. Yeah, Matheson though he's such a nice guy that like if he would have be- I can't I don't know what flyer he was trying to do it to, but if he would have believed him, he would yell like sorry like <laughs> because he's. <laughs> he was he's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so perfectly spot on. Yeah, I guess yeah. Happy, happy for Keith Yandel just because I it, he's a funny guy. He's a good guy. Personality when we don't see a lot of players showing the kind of personality that he shows, but um, yeah, crazy that both those things happened in the same night. Uh, I don't know how how do you feel after that game if you're him? I don't know, but yeah, a lot of drama coming out of Philly just with. <sighs> potential rebuild, retool, whatever you want to call it. Claude Giroux, I mean, it's kind of like up in the air what happens with him. It did come out on Wednesday that um, – so the Flyers are pretty much leaving up to Giroux what happens with him moving forward. You know, if he wants out and wants to, I don't know, maybe win sometime in his career, like I guess they'll look into doing that. But if he wants to stay, they're not going to unload him for picks, prospects, whatever, try to rebuild, retool. And I guess and so Giroux, he is going to meet with his agent, his agent's Pat Brisson uh, at the All-Star game in Vegas and uh, discuss his future with the Flyers. But, uh, yeah, just, just crazy stuff happening in Philly. Yeah. You have a hard time picturing the Flyers without Giroux, but at the same time it's like – the guy wants to win. Why, you know, of course yeah. that's like, you know, no matter what any player, what any team, any player on any team says, it's a lot easier when you're winning and then when you're losing. And clearly this is a guy who, you know, is such a talent and, you know, wants to go out there and win a cup. I'll be, I would feel, I have a feeling he's going to go somewhere just because, and it's going to be, I mean, like, I, granted you almost say, you don't know how Philly will react. And then you're like, you never know. I feel like they would have a soft spot, but also like, <laughs> It's Philly, so I don't entirely know how that fan base would react, especially with a guy who's been there for so long and has done what he's done for that franchise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this will be one of the ones too. This could be a fun trade deadline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Bobby Clark's trying to figure out how to put this on uh, Ron Hextall. We talked oh, about yeah. that. Uh, you really speak- will. Yes, we can hear yeah. Speaking of losing, the Sabres and the Senators, uh, so they played uh, those two, yeah, Tuesday night, today's Wednesday, we're recording this. Uh, kind of a crazy moment, uh, Aaron Dell, Sabres goaltender, Drake Batherson, he's on the Senators. Batherson was kind of skating behind the net, Dell had come out a little to play the puck. It, weird kind of play, Dell just kind of like raised his arm into him, but he took Batherson off of his feet, Batherson went into the 
boards and uh and he's he's hurt now I, as we're recording this Aaron Dell they he did get suspended three games um kind of crazy how often do you see like a goalie get suspended in the league multiple games for like a dirty play yep I can't think of the last time I've seen it but just uh what do you think of that that play yeah, it was one of those for me, and, and I don't know. I feel like I need to watch a little bit more of it and, like, really see. But, like, it was one of those – it was, like, such a bang-bang type of play. Like, it was definitely interference. It, it was, you know, I agree with that. Is it suspension-worthy? And then you kind of get into the nuance here of, like, okay, well, people I'm sure on Twitter right now are yelling, oh, well, you know, he was suspended, but uh, what's-his-face that hit Teddy Bluger wasn't? Brendan Dillon. Mm-hmm. So it's like – and we know we know consistency and we know the nhl um but it was just one of those to me didn't and you also you also felt so i mean you always feel bad in general for both players people were really upset with uh batherson now he's gonna miss the all-star game he's been kind of a really good role player for that team and then Poor Aaron Dell too. I mean, I obviously I'm not, I'm just saying more of like poor in terms of like the reaction, but like he, one of the reporters in Buffalo after that game had like told him that Batherson was hurt and wouldn't be returning and like basically full on like broke that news to him. And he just, you could tell, I think the quote I saw was he was like, I would never try to hurt anybody. Like you could tell it was like a genuine shock. And he's a younger player too. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong there. He's a younger guy. So, you know, yeah. Oh man! Yeah, it just—it looked like it happened so fast. I mean, maybe it looked like he was like trying to—he uh, wasn't trying to knock him off his feet, send him into the boards. But it, it looked like yeah. it, it was just something that happened so fast. So maybe I mean, you don't have a lot of time to think about that. Um, I don't know. Wires crossed, but uh, Murray talked about it. You know, after two on on Ottawa, and um, you know, he he made he made he said he doesn't like to you know call out other goaltenders, but he did bring up that you know like as a goaltender you really can't get hit. You're not taking contact in any way. So skaters, they don't expect to get it from you. Yeah. So even, you know, something like that, which maybe might just be an interference penalty, it's not a situation where a skater is ever going to be expecting that to come, so they can't prepare for it, which maybe why, you know, Batherson got knocked off his feet, went mm-hmm. into the board. So uh, it's just tough to see. Uh, yeah. Hopefully he's not out too long. Um, but, uh, so we've, we've talked about the Olympics uh, a bit on, on here and just, I mean, who's, was going to go for the Penguins and now they're not going, who's going to fill those spots. I, I went through and I looked some, pretty much all the rosters are up right now, except for, I think China, which no Penguins would be on that roster anyway. But no. I mean, you look at the, the ex Penguins and, you know, or ex Penguins prospects picks that are in the Olympics. And there's a lot, I mean, I, so I wrote about it. You can find it DK Pittsburgh sports on our Penguins page, but uh, it just, it's like a who's who of like, Oh, that guy. Or like, I hated him when he was here. It's just like some of these names that are coming up. Um, Sergei Plotnikov is the one that comes up. I mean, for Russia, he was, so when they signed him out of the KHL, it was a it was a big deal, and you know I think like a lot of teams were interested in him, and he was you know big point producer in the KHL, and then he comes over to Pittsburgh and he plays thirty three games, he gets two assists, that's it, doesn't score, and like it just was not a fit. They ended up unloading him in a trade, but uh, so he's yeah he's gonna be playing uh, for Russia. He went back to Russia, he's scoring again, like he just didn't fit here. Um, the guy they actually got back in that trade, uh, Matthias Plotka, he's German, he, who played Wilkesbury, he's an Olympian. Um, it's funny, the team with the most, um, the country with the most Penguins ties, like player-wise, is Germany, which I don't think anyone would have expected. But yeah, so Plotka, um, Freddie Tiffles, who he played in Wheeling and Wilkesbury for a year he got called up and down 11 times uh in the one year and then the following he was a draft pick so then the following year after that after they i was interviewing him that year and it's like dude how do you keep doing that drive and he's like i just listen to like a podcast and kind of tune out and i was like what but um yeah so the following uh training camp he did ask to be released for his contract to go back to germany not surprised after everything he went through here but so good to see that he's going to the olympics dominic cahoon who uh, he's out of the NHL. He was in Edmonton last year. He he signed in Switzerland this year, um, three year deal. So he, he's going to be there. And then Tom Kunakel, who this is his first year out of uh, North America. He's playing in Sweden. Um, so 
a lot of guys to watch for. I, I think it's interesting. Five guys who played in Wheeling in the East AHL, the Nailers have five Olympians. I, the Nailers have the most – uh, the ECHL record for most players who have gone on to the NHL. So uh, good history, maybe not so much as of late in Wheeling. They've been kind of bad for a couple of years, but a lot of, you know, good guys who come through there, developed in Wheeling. Casey to Smith started there on an ECHL contract, but five Olympians, that's pretty crazy. Um, uh, yeah, just a couple of good stories. The most recent one is Yannick Weber. I'm sure, like, does anyone remember Yannick Weber? So the Penguins signed him last year when they had a bunch of defensemen hurt. Yep. Uh, he, he, they saw to play, I think, a defenseman short that first game after because he got stuck in a snowstorm on his way to joining the team. <laughs> remember that? Great. I hear that yeah. story all the time. And then he, um, he played two games in New York, and then he spent the whole year on the taxi squad. So that's Yannick Weber's uh, Penguins tenure. Uh, he's an Olympian. For Switzerland, but yeah, just uh, crazy stuff. The Gonchar is going to coach uh, for Russia. He's an assistant coach, and then current Penguins director of uh, player development and former Penguins player. He won a cup with them in, the, in '91. Uh, Scott Young. Uh, he's I guess he's a. I, I don't know how they draw the line of who is and isn't allowed to coach in the Olympics with NHL yeah. ties because he's employed by the Penguins now, but he's going to be an assistant coach for Team USA. Uh, so. If uh, you're a Penguins fan uh, and looking for reasons to stay up to watch the Olympics, uh, there's quite a few. Uh, most of them are in yeah. Germany somehow. Uh, so is, it, is, like, is Germany the secondary team that people are going to root for? I, I mean, you know what? Hey, yeah. anybody, I feel like it's obviously Team USA, but I feel like everybody's like, eh, anybody but Canada. I'm like, all right, that's fair. That's fair. We'll allow it. And uh, yeah. There's ties. The, There's ties. There. Yeah. So the the U.S. Uh, just to touch on it. Two ties. David Warsawski, who had three separate stints with the Penguins. Um, like he signed, and then he got claimed off of waivers, and then signed again, and then he got traded, and then he got signed again. So uh, David Warsawski <laughs> was captain of Wilkes-Barre uh, last year. He's um, he's going to be on Team USA defenseman, and then Kenny Agostino. He's a forward. He never played for the Penguins. He was a draft pick. They traded his rights away in the Jerome McGinley trade. I've yep, so many right. like bad trades the Penguins uh, have made that representatives are in the Olympics, <laughs> like yes. Plotnikov, or like signing like Plotnikov. And then the one, another one that I know fans hate. So Canada, um, Alex Grant, who played in Wilkes-Barre for a while, Ben Street, who played in Wheeling Wilkes-Barre, um, Daniel Winnick on on uh, he's a forward on Canada. He really didn't play in. Uh, he was a free agent. He, uh, he was signing in, in February, and then he left via free agency. Um, it kind of, I, I don't know if you'd say like, in a, uh, he's not like a real enforcer. I think they were expecting like at least some like point production out of him too. That really didn't happen. But just looking at like what they gave up for him um, in that trade, so they got him from Toronto. They sent Zach Sill, which you're not notable, but then a second round pick and a fourth round pick. Um, this was in, like, 2016, so, like, you think of, like, just how yeah, shallow the Penguins' prospect pool is and the um, picks that they've wasted on moves like that that just didn't seem great in the first place. And then, I don't know, but a lot of interesting storylines in the Olympics, a lot of Penguins' ties. Uh, before we go, we have to acknowledge the recording this on Wednesday. Jared McCann and the Seattle Kraken are coming to town and just, I am sure maybe not a lot of Penguins fans have been following Seattle just because, you know, out west, but Jared McCann is their leading scorer. Um, yep. He leads in goals and points, 16 goals, uh, 25 points. That's already a career high in goals. Uh, not quite yet. And I think he's like maybe 10 um, points away from a career high. But uh, just what do you think of, of him going out there having a career year and just being such a huge fit in Seattle? Yeah, I mean, good for him, you know, and he even said, too, I feel like I remember, you know, because he was with, what, three teams in four years, something to that extent. Yeah. He kind of just, you know, bounced around a little bit, um, obviously was loved in Pittsburgh, and it was a love and hate, I feel like there was a little bit of money. He was going through his goal-scoring drought. 
um, the full, what was it, the full calendar year where he didn't score a goal? Like that obviously yeah. weighs on you. But for we we do see this too when you see expansion teams like guys kind of going somewhere else and getting the chance to revitalize their career, you know, be that key guy. I mean, you know, McCann never would have been the leading goal scorer on this team. I mean, maybe he would have been up there and, you know, we've seen the production from him, but, you know, good for him to kind of be in Seattle and kind of finding that niche and, you know, having that fan base. I mean, I think that's the coolest thing for some of these guys too, is you look at these fan bases, you look at Seattle where, you know, it's hockey is something people up there have wanted for so long. They want reasons to root for a team. You know, those fans have bought in and, you know, they're, it kind of has like that ride or die feel where it's like, these are my guys. I love it. So and I feel like too, if you're a player like Jared McCann that had bounced around like that, that's kind of the perfect fan base to go to and to be a part of. And, you know, in your inaugural year in this team's inaugural year to have the season that he's having, you know, I mean, that's something the, the, these fans are like latching on to this and latching on to him and, you know, how, how cool for him. I'll be uh, intrigued to see if, uh, what the, what the tribute video looks like. And I'll also be intrigued. Uh, we were talking about this to see, does uh, Brandon Tanev make the trip to uh, say hello to his buddy, old pal, uh, Kasperi Kapanen. Yeah, so I would I would not expect a tribute video. So ever since the Penguins won the back to back cups, they have kind of had that's the bar for to get an actual video. Yeah, you okay. had to have won a cup. So yeah. some teams, okay. some teams yeah, definitely like a tribute, tribute, tribute video. I'm sorry, that's what yeah. I, the, I the video. The like you know salute. Hey, Jerry yeah, McCann. Sometimes, yeah. So they, they will do that. They'll put up like a welcome back, Jared McCann. You know that. Yeah, that's right. But he won't get like a full video that that has no. that wasn't always the case. Some teams definitely like overdo it and it kind of loses. Yeah. Its... But I remember there's a James Neal after the Penguins traded him his first game back. And we're hearing they had a tribute video made, but and you know normally they pick like a TV timeout to do that when, but the reception James Neal had gotten before that came, he was getting booed every time he touched the puck, so they didn't air that video. It was just um, like, no, no. So, yeah. yeah, so, yeah, they might, I'm sure they'll get recognized, or at least McCann if Tanev's not there on the video board. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is his fourth team, Vancouver, Florida, uh, you know, Pittsburgh, and now Seattle. I think this is, when a, a young guy bounces around like that, I think fans – automatically assume that like oh, something must be wrong with him. There's a reason why he's on his fourth team this amount of time, you know, when he's so young, whether it's, you know, his play or an issue in the locker room, McCann was like the nicest guy. I don't think that's it, yeah. but I, that's why I don't think that's something you can ever like put too much stock in just because sometimes you just need a great, a great fit. Now he's in Seattle and he seems to have found that. And because when the Penguins uh, got Alex Nylander, from Chicago, you know, he's pretty young. This is his third organization. There was some fans who were like, uh, you know, there must be a reason for that, that he's bounced around so much. And I, it seems like he just didn't find the right fit. And at least now, I mean, he's played 11 games in Wilkes-Barre. He has 10 points. Um, I mean, before the trade this year, he was in the AHL with Rockford and he had 12 in, in 23. So it just seems like where he is right now is some a much bigger fit. Um, yeah than he was, you know, in past organizations. So, yeah, sometimes that's just all it is, and it seems like that's what was uh, the case of Jerry McCann. So, yeah, it'll uh, – that, that's the Thursday game. Yeah, it'll be uh, – I guess when you're listening to this, if you listen to this before the game. But, yeah, it'll be it'll be nice to see him back. Uh, hopefully he gets a nice ovation from the crowd at least. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good time to, to wrap it up. Uh, thanks again for listening to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Avenue. Episodes drop every – Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts, we have a YouTube channel too where you can watch them, but Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you can find us. Uh, We hope you'll join us next week.